This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, and Eventide. So get ready to rock. Man, I got over gear snobbery a long time ago, man. You know, it's just just because you have $3,000 worth of mic or $5,000 worth of mic or $10,000 worth of mic on something doesn't mean it's going to sound that way. You know, it's just... If something doesn't if something doesn't sound right, I was like, all right, what's wrong with it? Oh, it's too bright. Get a less bright, bright mic. What does it sound like in the room? Let's make it sound like that. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mike Kozowski, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals, so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Steve Shady, who began his career as an intern at Willie Nelson's Perdinalis Recording Studio in 1995, quickly working his way up to assistant engineer for Larry Greenhill. Upon Greenhill's departure, he took on the position of head engineer, capitalizing on the learning opportunities presented while working alongside many great producers, including John Porter, Paul Leary, and a recurring 14-year stint with legendary producer Andy Johns. Over the last 24 years, he's recorded Willie Nelson at Perdinalis Recording Studio, including vocals and guitar on Last Man Standing, My Way, for which he received a Grammy for Best Traditional Pop Vocal Album, God's Problem Child, Willie Nelson and the Boys, and Summertime, Willie Nelson Sings Gershwin. Other credits with Willie include Tracking Engineer on Heroes, Let's Face the Music and Dance, Django and Jimmy, Willie's collaboration with Merle Haggard in 2015, and Mixing on December Day, a collection of work he recorded with Willie and his sister Bobby in between touring on impromptu sessions that date as far back as 2004. Steve has been awarded multiple gold and platinum records and several Grammy nominations spanning a wide range of artists including Sublime, Los Lonely Boys, The Super Suckers, and Merle Haggard. Whether recording major label artists or local bands, Steve approaches the task with the same enthusiasm and attention to detail and artist comfort as he was taught to do from the start. He has a deep respect for the art and is always willing to lend a helping hand, gear, or advice to upcoming young engineers that he collaborates with. He is of the opinion that this is an apprentice-based guild and knowledge should be passed down to these engineers to keep the craft alive. Truly in the spirit of recording Studio Rockstars, I would agree. So please welcome Steve Shady to Recording Studio Rockstars. Steve, my man, are you ready to rock? I am ready to rock. Dude, it's awesome to have you on the show, man. 
um, rock stars in, in full transparency. I met Steve this summer at the uh, Summer NAM event here in Nashville, and we were all hanging out and just totally hit it off. So, Steve, I'm glad you were able to take time out to do this with us. It's, it's an honor to have you here on the show, dude. Oh, thanks, man. I'm glad to do it. So where are you joining us from now? Well, right now I'm, um, quote, unquote, having time off, but that means I'm in Denton, where my sister lives, just north of Dallas, Texas. And uh, I come up here and I bring my rig and I edit Willie stuff or just work on things that don't need a super controlled environment, you know? Yeah. It's pretty amazing. I mean, I did a lot of that, um, you know, like portable editing stuff when I was making records on the road. And it's quite amazing how you could be in a studio doing stuff and then just take a laptop and go off to some, you know, sit, sit at a kitchen countertop with a coffee in your hand if you want to, to edit all the, all kinds of things in headphones. Oh man, I love it. You know, everybody, uh, or at least in, in my part of the world, everybody's still all tape crazy, which I love a good piece of tape, you know, but portability, flexibility, you know, it's just, for me, I love the computer pro tools in general, but really anything that turns it into a number that you can manipulate. Yeah. Um, tell us more about who you are and how you got started out in this recording stuff. Yeah. I basically fell into this, into this, uh, I was living in, in Denton studying music. I got pretty burned out on that. So I went uh, to a little town South of Austin called San Marcos and they had an engineering program that would accept my music hours. So that was the criteria for me. You know, what could get me out of school the quickest and what would accept my hours? And I walked in and started doing it and was like, wow, this is really cool. And the fellow that was working there uh, used to work at Willie's and he got me a, he got me a uh, internship there and here I am 24 years later. Wow. <laughs> going, that's wow, amazing. What yeah, yeah, it's great. So that was the 90s? That was in 1990. Well, the internship was late 94, and then they just kept me on there. I mean, it's I've always been contract labor. That's how it just works around here. But, uh, you know, I never left, basically. That kept, the phone kept ringing. Uh, well, that's pretty cool. You know, it's funny because when I look back at your discography, it seems to go back a lot earlier than than the 90s. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a credit on there from 1970, <laughs> which is not correct. I was two, but I worked with Bobby Whitlock on a on a, a redo of Layla, and basically that's what that's from. The Meat Puppet stuff I was see, all yeah. reissued, remastered stuff, and I helped I helped a guy in town, Stuart Sullivan. I helped him remaster that stuff, so that's got 80s dates. But really, I, I started getting credits about 95. Oh, that's cool. All right. So, um, well, you know, the Meat Puppets are one of my favorite bands. So do you have any stories you want to kind of share about that experience at all? Was it, was that something that was, uh, you know, was an important moment for you or was it something kind of in, in passing? Cause I know sometimes credits can be, you know, something we worked on for an hour or one day. Um, but do you share the story about that if you want? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Kirk and the guys came in to Pernalis, I guess. God, I, I don't even remember the date on that, but uh, it was via um, Paul Leary, the butthole surfers, a guitar player and producer. Right on. And he, uh, he uh, yeah, he's, he's done, a, I've worked on a few records with him via, again, Stuart Sullivan. But uh, he had, they, they were familiar with the studio through him. Uh, they came in not he wasn't producing on the on the set but on the the date but yeah they came in for about a week did some recording and uh they are interesting guys man i mean right up my alley dark humor all kinds of stuff man. you know not sure yeah. how in depth i can go but <laughs> for example there was a there was an accident out there a motorcycle accident during the course of the session that i didn't know about and I was looking at all these pictures of this guy lying around on the ground and I asked the guy, I was like, what, what is that all about? He goes, yeah, we came up on this guy a couple of days ago. They had found this dude who flew off his motorcycle and they were, I guess that's how they were processing it. They were all drawing pictures of it. So, wow. really, <laughs> so that kind of stuff, you know, the, it was, it was, it was interesting. I was still very green. So everything was interesting, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, that actually reminds me when my band would be on tour um, one of the things we like to do is if we were in the van driving up to Chicago to play a show, we, uh, like Chris, our singer would collect a few different anecdotal, you know, one few sentence stories that people had shared. 
throughout the band. And then we just hand this poster around and everybody would have to like doodle out a little drawing and we'd stick those up as posters for the next show. So it makes sense. You know, maybe they're just like, whatever's the story in and around the band, they, they start drawing and telling about so that they got more content. Yeah, that's cool because you get everyone's perspective on it. It's like giving the same guitar and amps to three different people. You get the same. You get three different things out of it. So it's interesting to see what something evokes from each individual person. Yeah, indeed. All right. So those guys came in, and you guys were doing some remastering in 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 the studio, the, the same space where you would be tracking and mixing as well. Well, the remastering was a separate occasion. Uh, they came in and were cutting, just cutting tracks with, I think it was, might have been John Plymel. I can't remember who, who was producing them. Like I said, that was late 90s. Um, but the mastering thing was a whole different, different ball of wax. Stuart Sullivan was remastering stuff and he kind of got, you know, you get turned around in it when you're just doing your own thing with no objectiveness and subjectiveness, whatever. And, and he just asked me to come over and we sat there for a couple of days listening to the stuff and, you know, gave that me the credit. Great, that, man. Yeah. That was without them around the, 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 the recording part was just completely separate from that. It was a different session. And the recording part you did with those guys. Um, and so, uh, do you remember any, you know, things that were interesting to you about the, the, you know, the way you recorded those guys or any of the sounds that you got that was kind of fun at that time? I mean, we we were still using tape back then. And I mean, they're, you know, they've been there and done that. They were good. We didn't have to, it was pretty, pretty regular routine session. You know, they just came in, we went to, we have an eight Studer 800. We went to that. I love that machine. You can punch it. If you get rid of the, there's a, there's a head gap problem on that. But if you get rid of that with this mod, it's just seamless. Uh, man, it's, I hate to disappoint you. It was pretty uneventful. They came in <laughs> and killed me. <laughs> so when you talk about the head gap problem, you're talking about the ability to punch in and out of something or you're talking about, yeah, I guess so, right? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. They, there's basically, I've never worked on a machine that didn't have the mod, but apparently if it doesn't, there's, you know, you have to guess you've been on a machine like that where you just get a feel for it. But yeah, indeed. I have an MCI JH 16 here. And, and if you don't, I mean, it's not terribly forgiving about punching. Um, but, yeah. but later MCI made something called a choir mod, which allowed you to, to quietly punch in and out. Yeah. I, I saw that on your video on Instagram, man. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Tape alignment day. I think it was. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty fun. I, you know, I, honestly, uh, in full transparency, I mean, I hadn't, uh, all that, that's like my new terrible new saying, full transparency. I got to come up with a new one. But um, I hadn't had the machine hadn't been on in a couple of years. And then I, I had an opportunity to use it again recently. And it was, it was really fun to go through that alignment process, discover that like the old reel of tape was just fine, you know, and, um, and use it and have it sound killer. Yeah, that's the hard part, finding decent tape. Yeah, you know, I've been using the same reels that I got um, on a on a session up at Electrical Studios, um, M Tech nine hundred, and I just been using the shit out of them. I just use them over and over again. I think it, probably if I get a fresh reel in here, I'll be like, "Wow, that sounds so much better." But uh, these ones still sound super cool, so I just keep using them. Yeah, man, I got a I got a batch of this, I can't remember what it was ATR maybe it was several years ago. And half of it was good and half of it was bad. And I noticed the smell yeah. of the bad. Yeah. So there was one smell. We started identifying the bad reels by the smell. Uh, it's hard to get, for at least around here, it's hard to get good tape. But old tapes, you know, if if it's well stored, it's, it works. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And and I know, I think new, uh, new tape is come around to being reliable, but I know that it was quite a transition process again for a little while there. Yeah, Just trying to get the formulas down and everything. Yeah, man, and and then uh, going back to you aligning, I re I remember the first time I had to use tape again. Uh, the last thing I did fully on tape was 2007, and uh, it had been several years. I was like, God, I don't even know if I remember how to align this thing. And you know, you, you get in there and boom, it all comes right back to you. And it was it was a piece of cake. I guess it's like riding a bike. Yeah. So you know, one of the things I do now is I try and shoot little reminder videos to myself and store them away in a cloud drive somewhere so that, cause there are these, there are these things you do in the studio as you get older and older, where like you, you have to come back and do them and you should know them, but it might've been, you know, a year, two years since you did it last. 
And it's really helpful to have some little, you know, you know, teach your future self how to do this same task that seems so familiar right now. Exactly. I mean, that's why I rely heavily still. Uh, I still input stuff in my computer, but legal pad and paper. And the, <laughs> the young guys at the studio all laugh at me. I'm like, I've never seen a legal pad crash. So when your shit goes down and you're panicking, I'm just going to reach into my folder here and grab out my legal pad notes. <laughs> yeah, indeed. You know, actually, I mean, I just take uh, pencil notes right now while we're doing this interview. and uh, And I'll do physical notes all the time in the studio, but I sort of take advantage of the computer because then I'll just take a photo of my notes and upload that into the folder with everything. There's that too. And then I use, uh, actually, that's one of your little questions on the little sheet. You said, what is it? I didn't think about it. What's a software tool? And it's this simple program called Paper. So if yeah. you're a tactile person like me, if you have a notepad or a, you know I- iPad or whatever, you can just get a stencil and you can still write down. For me, when I write something, I remember it better than just typing it in. So yeah. And then there's the old pictures. That's that was huge on recall, man. You didn't have to write those recall sheets and all that stuff. You just take a picture. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. I don't do any recall sheets. I just do pictures as best I can. The pictures are still a little tricky because somewhere in there you got to put a sheet that says this was connected to that in this order, you know. But uh, beyond that, just to get the settings right, it's so nice to take photos. Hey, yeah. so. So I like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote on the podcast to kind of kick us off. You got anything? Um, you, you you do seem to spend an awful lot of time with one of the most uh, inspirational quoters and and others. You know, and I'm pretty sure Willie Nelson's got a few things to say about that. <laughs> well, comes to mind is uh, we were sitting there one day and somebody asked Willie, you know, are you going to go see such and such band playing down at the Spoke? And he goes... Now nah, I saw him play there on the way up. I'll see him on the way down, which, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of puts it into perspective that, you know, life is a series of hills and valleys. So don't get, don't get too low and don't get too high. Just kind of keep even keel. And, you know, when you're at the top, don't let that get to your head, you know, just realize, Hey, this is a good moment. Take it for what it is. Um, can we let it get to our head if we're not at the top yet? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The top is where you put it. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, that reminds me, Steve Albini had a funny quote. Um, I think it was the first time he was on the show and, and he said, um, you know, maybe I asked him if he went out to see live music or, or somebody else did. And, um, you know, his answer was like, you know, what does a, what does a hooker n- not do on her night off? <laughs> I was like, okay. I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's something I was. I'm, I don't want, don't want to use the word struggling, but I I put you know I was a musician for till I was 26, you know, and I put the guitar down after after 12 hour days in the studio day after day, and I've I've recently picked it back up in the last year and kind of getting my chops back and all the stuff that I thought was you know worn out and lame because you get over yourself after a while. At least I do. I'm like, oh yeah, this was fun. I remember this. It's not so important to be innovational and, you know, for me, it's just about feeling good and playing guitar. It makes me feel yeah. good. I've forgotten about that. Yeah. I've been playing a lot more uh, myself. I started a record this year I'm in the middle of, and um, well, actually, hopefully by the time this comes out, I'm done with it. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's just been super fun to play and it's like, I don't feel stressed about it. I, I just want to follow through just do it have fun with it you know there's still yeah. the funny thing is doing my own record now when i do the post production stuff it's like i know what i can do and what i probably should do and i'm able to kind of dig get into the weeds if i want to um and even if something even if i might decide later oh, i wish i hadn't gone so deep in the weeds on this i also feel like i have to go try it to decide whether or not i really like it or not <laughs> Right. So, so it those bits can feel like some pretty hard work in focus bits, but uh, but every time I get to actually play some music, it's just a blast. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 part of me that I let. I mean, I, I still experience music through other people playing and getting off on sounds and and capturing all that. But there's something about you know three notes in the right place. You know, Dear Prudence, for example. Every time I hear Dear Prudence, I'm like, wow, he's just going down, down. You know, it just moves me. So, That's right. yeah, it just works. Music, music, music is just everything to me. Um, so, you used to play guitar on sessions, and and do you think you might do that again? 
Uh, yeah, not so much on sessions. I played out in bands. I had I've, I've been in, I was in several bands, and then I, like I said, I fell into this gig, and it started. It slowly overtook everything. It dominated my life at first. You know, just trying to claw claw your way in and, and just do it, man. Yeah. And the guitar, I just pulled a guitar out of a case this year that I hadn't opened in 20 years. I was like, whoa, man, time capsule. (laughs) I hope the neck was all right. It was fine. It was actually as close to being in tune as you. That's hilarious. It's like, (laughs) wow, dude, okay. Um, So, you know, you've done a lot now in the studio. Uh, You've certainly been with Willie for an awfully long time. Um, And now, you know, people just turn to you and you're responsible for all kinds of, uh, you know, very important sessions and re- responsibilities, but I can't imagine it was always perfect. So I wonder if you could remember any, you know, important failures for you initially or along the way that became real learning experiences, you know, like a nightmare in the studio story or anything like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if it'd be classified as a failure, but I used to ch- Try, yeah, I guess so, because it didn't work out. I would try to be so prepared, you know, especially with tape, you know, I, was, I, I would call, make sure they had two toms, three toms, this, that, like over prepared to the point where you're so built up, you you can't be flexible. Right. Or to be flexible takes more time than what you're trying to achieve by being ready. So, you know, I've, I really killed some vibes by being dug in too far and then having to re redo stuff, you know, now with the, with the computer, you can juggle stuff around, you got tracks and all that stuff, but you can subgroup things, but not really be subgrouping them and all, all that. But I think overthinking things has in the beginning cost me a lot of time and, and stress that I was trying to avoid. <laughs> so I just quit overthinking things. I, I don't even, I don't know, I'll put a few standard, you know, I have a, what I call the New York special, which is a pretty standard miking that I'll do for everything and then go from there. That way, if the shit hits the fan, you know you, these are going to work. It might not be the most exciting, adventuresome studio but day, but you're going to get the job done. And go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, what's the New York special? How do you break well, that down? For me, it's you know RE20 and a FET47 on the kick. 57 or a 201 buyer 201 top or, and bottom snare 87s or KM 184s just basic standard meat and potatoes mics that you know are going to work 87s on the rooms uh, 87s maybe on the overheads or or what KM 184s 451s just things that aren't you know really spectacular but they're just they're meat and potatoes it's going to it's going to get the job done then if if, you, if you're comfortable enough knowing, well, these are working, I might try something that I've never tried or that I saw someone else try. Let's do this. You can break out of the box, but know that with a switch swap of a cable, you can get right back in the box, get it working. Yeah. So, uh, you know, don't be shy of breaking down the meat and potatoes for for us. We love to hear <laughs> those things. Uh, nothing's too uh, too simple for us, you know, as far as name dropping on mics and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, Tom's 421s. Uh, let me see, guitars, a 57 and a 421. Uh, bass, either a, you know, bass, I would use anything from a D12 or to RE20 or even a 57. Just things you know are going to work. Stuff I was taught, I was... I came up in a very, uh, uh, how do you put it? You had to be pretty clinical because a lot of times the stuff was going out somewhere. When Willie's place ran commercially we had all kinds of stuff coming in there and you had to get it done get it right because you're going to tape and it had to go out the door and be good yeah. so it's a, it was a very uh, clinical or safe safe way to go which the next guy that got it could go a lot of different directions with it where now not so much i can do what i want i can you know, if I know I'm, I'm keeping what I'm doing, which is usually the case, uh, you know, I'll, I'll box myself into something if, if I'm pretty damn confident about it. Right. But if, if it's your project, then there's more room for you to commit to the art, artistic decision on something. Whereas if you're having to deliver for repeat clients, you might have to play it a little bit safer and just make sure that like, you know, here's like you said, the meat and potatoes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, recording so 
the guy I learned from Larry Green, you know, he was, you know, he didn't want the faders too far apart. You know, you don't want one down at way down at five and then the other one at plus five. And, you know, he wanted to see a straight line and send it out the door. Very correct, I guess, which was great as, a, as, as, like I said, a safe way to go, you know, it's going to work, but it wasn't too exciting. Once he split, I started goofing around doing stuff, you know, uh, what's some of the first stuff you remember goofing around with where you're like, Ooh, I'm going to try this. Oh, the, the Los Lonely Boy stuff for sure. We had days and days in there and they were notoriously uh, writers in the studio. They'd come in with less than ideas and we would just roll and and leave it rolling. By this time, Pro Tools was there. We just have big hard drives and let it roll. Mm-hmm. And I could literally go out there while they were you know, running down songs, knowing they were going to redo it again, swap out mics or have two or three mics and patch them over while they were doing it. Yeah, you know, just stuff like that. So the less lonely boy stuff. And just keep Pro Tools running the whole time? Yeah. You know, have your guy in the control room mute the, you know, what are the channel so it doesn't pop and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. just leave it running. There's a, a paint palette or whatever, a sketchbook, you know. Did you ever, um, you know, sparking ideas for me, but let's say you had 24 inputs, but you only were using 16 mics out on the floor to begin with. Would you actually put 24 tracks and record so that like, you could actually fire up an extra mic and just patch it right in and unmute that channel. And now there's a, you know, a 17th mic going. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's most definitely just everything in record. I mean, hard drives are pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah. That's clever. I've never, I've actually never tried that. I I usually, um, am I'm trying to hit record the moment I think something's about to happen, but usually it's a little more of this, you know, the, still controlled thing, but I like that idea of just putting a 24, putting every track you can into record at the beginning and then just start patching things in as you go and figure it out as you go, you know, just keep right. adjusting while the or band's even ha- figuring out. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Or even having mics already patched in that are experimental and, and then doing what you're saying, nah, that's not working. Let's swap it out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But we all know the talk back mic for the bass player is the best drum mic in the, in the room, no matter what you do, even, even <laughs> if you, emulate a, a bass player talk back mic. It just doesn't come out right. You just have to not be trying. <laughs> That's so funny. That's uh, for me, it's always been the scratch vocal mic. Cause I'm in probably in smaller spaces where the vocal was that close anyway. Um, and it's the same story. It's like that scratch vocal mic somehow just gives all this excitement and action to the drums. But if you try and use the same vocal mic in the same spot and they're not actually singing on it, it's not that special. You won't like it anymore. Yeah, that's the mystery. <laughs> it is a mystery. Very cool. Um, all right. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, your studio that you're working on. Or if you don't have your own studio, I heard, I've heard you talk about your go bag before for recording. Oh, yeah. I'll make anything into a studio, man. I mean, I've, I've over the years, I've gotten enough gear and none of it's super fancy, you know, just like that meat and potato stuff. A few nice things here and there, but mostly, you know, tube techs, 1176s, distressors, Swiss Army knife type gear, you know, stuff like that. And just that there's a box full of cables and things I know I'm going to need to at least have 16 channels wherever I go, except somebody was all up in my box this year. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but, and I got here and didn't have the right cables. <laughs> we were talking about that before. And I, Rockstars, I was saying that I, um, I agree. That happens to me and I get really pissed off. Like some mystery person moved that shit and I can't find it in the studio. It's just that it often turns out that the mystery person was my alter ego, other Lidge, who did it when I wasn't, when, when the real Lidge wasn't paying attention. <laughs> when you're in full throw, oh shit mode and you just run and go, I know there's a cable in that box and you whip it out. Don't remember. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> recording Studio Rockstars Academy is the place you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, 
Reaper, or anything else. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now, or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Cool, man. Well, so so when you were recording Los, uh, the Los Lonely Boys, what were some things about that session? Like, do you remember any specifics about how, what was cool about the either your recording technique with the mics or you know some some production uh, aspect of it that really got you excited? Well, um, I like the well. They're all in this. They 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 all insisted on their their instruments being in the same room which I'm, I'm down with that. So I became a master booth builder. Nice. <laughs> I will tell you, I travel in my truck. I have yoga mats, packing blankets, scraps of foam, stuff that looks like garbage. And, you know, there's, you got the right chunk of foam, fill that hole just perfectly. You know, <laughs> I, I look like Sanford and son in my truck with all this shit, but you know, built booth building is, is, pretty essential if you want to have some kind of separation. I don't mind a little bleed, some blood on the tracks, but with the, with a band like that, you know, you're going to go and overdub and do things over. But I just dug the way they really sat in the room and, and hashed out a song from almost nothing. And a lot of times what they thought was a joke or they're, they're, they're really great guys that joke around a lot, goof around, <laughs> ended up being a song on the record. Yeah, because you know, it had a cool vibe to it and everything. Yeah, or just a riff or something. And uh, the bass player, JoJo, he's pretty amazing. He would be like, I played something a couple hours ago when we were doing this. And he'd sit there and he'd find it. And that would turn into something, which is why I just keep rolling. I learned to keep rolling from Willie. We used to use those 14-inch reels. Man, that was my first job swapping reels out because Willie doesn't like to wait. Or he'll say, like, let's just run it down. And you better be rolling, dude, because then he's going to go, let's go listen to that. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with rolling and just shedding tape or gigabytes or whatever, just whatever, because if you miss it, you miss it. Yeah. So, um, so let's see, what does that mean today with Pro Tools? What are some of the ways that, that you feel like there's an opportunity to fail at keep rolling? And how do you, and like, what do you do to keep rolling when it's Pro Tools land? Well, I stay away from the keyboard for one thing, because if you're dicking around too much, you're inevitably going to stop the machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to try and do this, that, edit, oh, let's build this, let's do that. Blah, blah, blah. Now I'm just like, nope, don't touch it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why, the, I, that's yeah, why you get a second computer for checking email. Yeah, right. <laughs> or even just dropping something something on the damn space bar. I've dropped a phone, I've dropped, you know whatever a guitar tuner it stops the machine but man it's so easy now because you you don't have file size limitations you, you have big drives and it's just a matter of keeping track when you hear something because if you're rolling for an hour you know you don't want to be f fiddling around you just drop markers and it's easy um how do you feel about sonically analog tape versus recording digitally these days I mean, to me, it's apples and oranges. I don't think one's better than the other. With digital, you get out what you put in. If you you know, if you have quality, there's certainly artifacts and, and shitty sound. And, you know, like the mix, I, uh, the 888s, when they first came out, I didn't think they sounded great. But, man, I mean, I, I, I'm not bothered by any kind of digital medium. So I figure if I go in fat and warm, it's going to be that way when it comes out. But yeah. With the tape, you just learned how to, you knew that this kind of tape, if you hit it this way, or if you were at plus six, plus nine, it was going to react differently, whatever, which was kind of cool because th then again, you looked a lot smarter than just, <laughs> 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 it sounds like that now, but when I play it back, it's going to sound different, you know, the, and that's kind of cool, but that's I, don't, funny. I, I don't mind. If you go in quality, it's going to spit out quality. Unless something's wrong with your stuff. I mean, that's just me. I may be wrong. <laughs> well, there was a feeling with tape of uh, feeling like much more of a rocket scientist sometimes. Right. As the engineer, you know? Yeah. I mean, I like tape. I mean, I, I really like having an Ampex 102 sitting in the back of the room. So when it's all said and done, you throw it to that. But, you know, it's, I don't miss hiss. I don't miss any of that stuff. I listen to all these old records now where you hear the master and compressor kick in, then it goes away and it's yeah, you're like, hey. but yeah, on the other, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, 
that's also kind of the computers for a while spoiled music for me because I was n- nitpicking everything, you know, and I had to get back off of that and go, eh, doesn't matter. That, that brings to mind a pretty funny story is we were recording one day and someone walked in, in, in the door and you just kind of heard a little thump and I took it out and Willie came in and he listened and goes, that's great, but where's that noise? <laughs> put it back. I said, what? Uh, okay. He goes, yeah. So why do you want me to do that? He goes, that's the way it happened. I was that's like, interesting. okay, that's weird. I didn't get it. At first. He just wants it to go down the way it went down. Yeah. So, that's cool, man. That's cool. Well, it's fun watching these um, uh, videos and rock stars. Of course, I've included a, a YouTube playlist of a bunch of the great work that Steve has done with Willie and other people um, in a playlist. So you can find that in the show notes. But Willie just looks like a fun dude in the studio. He looks like a good-natured guy, and he, um, you know, he's been around for a minute, and you can see that physically. Um, and yet, like he just seems like he's, he's. Uh, it just seems like he enjoys the music still, and and recording it in the studio like he was still a kid, just discovering it for the first time. Um, and then another thing that I noticed is, unless it's just a trick of the video production. You know, he's sort of, you know, it looks like the vocal mic's in front of him and he's sort of, his head's a little, face a little bit sideways to the mic looking over at the lyric sheet. And so he looks kind of relaxed about it. But then when you listen to his voice, you're like, his voice is like perfectly delivering these lines. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, he works the mic and, you know, it's about a foot away from him. Well, I I don't set it up a foot away from him, but it ends up being a foot away from him. (laughs) That's just where he naturally gravitates towards. Yeah, and he'll lean in, lean out, move to the side. But, you know, for the most part, it's just there. His voice is so strong, and especially he's 86. I'm just amazed. Wow. You know, Haggard was like that. And and uh, Ray Price, man, the first time I did something with him, he was pushing 80, mid-70s, whatever. And he came in, and he just opened up on that mic. It was like, whoa. You know, if you closed your eyes, he was – 30 or 40, whatever, again, you know, it's like, damn, so projection. Um, and then I think one of the videos in there is, um, it's the, uh, it's all going to pot Willie Nelson and Merle <laughs> Haggard session. And yeah. so here's, I, I want you to definitely tell us about that session, but here is my question about it. Was it tough for you to stay focused? And I, and I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, not at all, man. I'm so used to that, that, I mean, I stopped partaking a long time ago because the Dutch scientists have ruined it for me, man. It's too fucking strong. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I just – I don't even think about it. It's it's just been a part of my world so long, even prior to Willie. It's just like furniture, you know, and yeah. I don't get a contact high for – you know, it's, I just – it's there. It's yeah. like a mic. I don't even think about it. Um, so one of the people that you worked with a bunch is Andy Johns. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to share any stories about working with him or any of the other great producers you've had a chance to work with. Yeah, Andy Andy was awesome. I miss him, man. You know, everybody thought he was pretty crazy and he could be pretty dicky at times. But underneath all that was just a big, sweet guy. I learned so much about drums and and, you know, just... God, the stories, you know, Rolling Stones, Exile on Main Street, all that stuff, you know, just, wow. yeah. Share, uh, Andy, share some of those, man. I mean, uh, Exile is one of my favorite records. Well, um, what stories did he tell you about that? Well, they were, they were in South of France, you know, for tax purposes. They did it in a house that was built by the, built by the, the Nazis, man. So he said there were little swastikas all over the floor and everything and embedded in the, and it was just weird, you know, as an wow. English guy and, you know, brought up after the war. And um, he did most of that with 57s. Really? Yeah, that's what he said. Now, Andy's also, you know, long before I showed up, he's, he was whacked out. So. <laughs> That's funny. That's what he said. He said it was 57, 57s and 1176s. That's, that was his deal. Well, that's pretty interesting. That's intriguing. I've got a 57. I've got an 1176. Maybe I just need to get my act together. Not, or not get it together. It might be the key. <laughs> Maybe not. I just always pictured that it was like all kinds of great vintage classic tube mics and, you know, giant UA knob preamps and stuff like that. 
Right, big nose stuff. Well, I'm sure somewhere online there's pictures and stuff, but you know, he got fired and hired from that gig a couple of times. Man, that was just madness back then. You know, when when you're 19, working with Hendrix and Eddie Kramer, and then he went to the top so fast that he just, you know, once he got, he didn't know where to go. I loved him. He was like a big kid. Uh, what about some other stuff that you learned from him about drums? You know, just how to tune them up and every drum has just stuff that a guitar player from Dallas who likes to shred doesn't know. Like every drum has a zone where it's ringing and singing. And and if you get too high or too low, that's going to you know not, not be happening. Uh, room mics, you know. I used to put them low. I, I put I put my room mics everywhere, just depending on on the session. But I'd never put room mics up high. You liked them up high. Most of his most of his sound was room mics. When you say low, you mean sort of like ear height or chest height, something like that. No, like down down at the kit, down like knee or thigh height. Right. And just depends on the on the era, I suppose. But yeah, he liked them up by where your ears were, or even higher. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. How would you describe the difference in those sounds? Well, it's if you're going to have you, if you're going to have your primary mics being the room mics, that's going to have your cymbal. It's more of a I'm standing in the room with the kit, less of a Steely Dan thing, you know. Which I like. I like all. I like it all, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't hate on dry drums. I don't hate on roomy drums. The drums are just drums, and it's however you. I, I like to be able to make them so dependent on what I want later. Again, with this, with the the clinical stuff, I put up all the flavors, so then I can just pick and choose later. Um, what are some of the uh, minimal miking techniques you like to use if you're you know if you were going to start a miking up a drum kit right now for kind of a creative cool record what might you start with for mics oh the mics are or or which one like kicks i do i do kick snare hat and maybe overheads if i had to do it just you know minimal and i would probably use those go-to mics man the re20 uh i don't have a fet 47 laying around so i would just use the re20 on the inside couple of pencil mics or some 87s on the overheads and a 57 or 201 in the hat. No, oh, t- well, the 201 is, which mic Bi- is that? A buyer 201. Buyer. Yeah, hypercardioid. It's good for keeping other stuff out of there. There's also an AKG. Damn, I can't remember the number on it, but it was, it, it, it had vents on the back and wherever you pointed those, it would reject them. But, oh, and cool. then if you want that chunky, chunky hat, just put throw 57 on there. And the buyer 201, is, is that a ribbon or a dynamic or something it, like that? It's dynamic. Car, hypercardioid is it's a stage mic but how I often like, do you use uh, ribbon mics on sessions uh man there was a while i was using ribbon mics in the rooms coles 40 33s or 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 uh royers royer has a stereo mic i, I use for a while or 121s but it just depends on what phase i'm going through but i i like a ribbon mic in a in a in a hard room and there's there was a studio in austin i used to use at clothes now that i Everything was too much. Like too, the ribbon mic was all you could use. But I like ribbon mics on on uh, room mics. I don't mind that. Yeah, I dig it. Um, yeah, I do too. I I try. I just like trying different stuff. I mean, sometimes it's frustrating that you can't try everything on every session. <laughs> yeah, know? right. <laughs> sometimes you feel like you have to wait. You're like, man, I got to wait like a month before I can try this mic on this. You know, in this particular way on a session because. Once you commit to something, you're sort of like you, you you go with it a lot of times, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. And, and time constraints and budgets. I mean, people aren't in the studio for a month anymore. People used to get the studio for a month to six weeks, like that Wilco session. They moved, we moved furniture in there, made it like a, a living room. Yeah, let's talk about that. Was that Summer Teeth? Was that the one? Yeah, that was Summer Teeth. And they I don't know why they picked Bird and Alice, man. They came down from Chicago and... They you know, posted up for a month and then came back for two weeks. And that record was done to tape. And then it was, it was really in the infancy of Pro Tools. And they took it out back to Chicago. And it came back completely different than the rough mixes. Like vastly different. I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was with Jay Bennett was still with them. They were, they were you know, pretty fun at the time. You know, there wasn't all this whatever went on later and everybody split up. But. They were cool, and then they were gone. That was, you know, 
it, you get, I would always get a little empty feeling when people left after spending 12 hours a day, four weeks in a row with somebody then you're cleaning up and there's a, just paper and dust balls on the floor and they're gone. You're just like, well, what happened? Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, man. And the truth is you don't necessarily, you know, it, it's weird. It's very intense. You really get to know a group of people and then you don't see them at all. Right. Unless you're out on the road or unless they just keep coming back for, for the next session. Yeah, they were cool. They came back a couple of times. One was for Austin City Limits and called called us up and one one other time for a show, and then you know, phone stops ringing. You know, just called us to come socially and see the see the right. show. Right. Well, I remember you know the first records I did with these bands, even if it was just like forty eight hours, it was it it felt very intensive, and it felt like you really got to know the people. And then later, I was like wait, who was in that band? Who are those people? And I feel bad about it now. It's just like, ah, whatever. You were right. quite, You work with so many people. You just get, you, you're like, there's no way you can remember everybody's names all the way through. Maybe, uh, maybe some people can, but you know, you just get used to that a little bit, but yeah, it's funny. The dust balls. Yeah. That's, that's definitely not me. I'm still writing people's names on the, you know, next to the instrument on the tape and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Which is shitty, but that's a, rather than go, hey, bass dude, you know, it's better to write his name down on the tape. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a funny thing. It's easy to not do that in Pro Tools and not remember because we don't, we don't automatically think of, you know, with a tape, with a, um, a track sheet for, for analog tape, it really was a mystery what was on that track unless you wrote a bunch of text down telling you what was going on, you know? Right. But with Pro Tools, you know, other than the name of the instrument, you know, kick or, or bass or something like that, you see so much visually in the track itself, you don't necessarily instinctively think to include notes like, well, what mic did I use? What amp was it? Who was playing? Stuff like that. But, um, you know, I think training ourselves to use the comment area to yeah. add all that stuff can be really smart because uh, the name, the naming is kind of sucks actually in Pro Tools. You can't really put much information in there at all. Right. Or else it turns into a truncated, like, nonsense word. Yeah, but something's good. I hate getting audio one, audio two, audio three. It's like, what is right. going on here, man? Right, yeah. So, well, uh, yeah, and looking at music and just all that stuff. The uh, the visual sense takes a, a dominance over the ear, at least in my body. That So I set up uh, one of those little hot corners, and whenever I'm not needing to look at the screen, I just – fling the mouse over there and boom screensaver comes on People. and and then what what do you do with the screensaver then you are you taking notes or you're just no no it's just if i'm listening like we used to with tape you know? oh, right so you okay. don't so you don't have to see the computer screen staring at you yeah or on playback i always do that because people will look at the line on the screen and go i heard that edit you know right not all the time but in general it's just as soon as i stop looking at the screen and, and there's nothing to look at. I'm listening better. And it seems that most of the people in the room are too. I agree with you. And I've, I've been paying more attention to that too. I'll notice that, you know, the, everybody else is in the room. They will stare at the screen while listening back. And I'm thinking like, what are you staring at? You know, like if I'm doing edits, yeah, stare so that we can, you can, you know, you, we're on the same page about what what's happening in that moment. But um, if it's, if we're just listening to stuff, just enjoy it, you know? So you, you talked about the hot corner, so you can throw your mouse up into the hot corner and you can set the hot corner up to be a screensaver or something like that. Yeah. I think that's in mouse and keyboard on the, on the app, on the Mac. I mean, okay, it's, cool. I, yeah, I use bottom, right. And I just roll it down and over. That's a good tip. Cause then it's sort of instinctive and quick. Another one that I'm doing now, I've got a trackpad set up with my studio computer and if I sort of triple finger swipe over to the side, mm -hmm. then it just pulls up like a black screen too, Yeah, which is kind of nice. Um, and then there was, a, I, I'm not using it enough to, to have it perfectly memorized, but one of the rock stars, our listeners, you'll know who you are. So thank you for this tip again, was um, I think it's a bear claw and the eject key or something like that turns off the screen yeah. to look at, or escape, yes. one of those two. There's one, I think, yeah, op option shift and eject or something like that. One of them shuts the computer down, so I don't want to test it right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't shut the computer down. But but yeah, if, if it's right, then it actually just turns the screen off. And then if, when you hit any key, it comes back. 
Right. So all those tips are good ones for um, for making Pro Tools just go the screen go blank, you know. Right, right. Rockstar, so we're going to take a quick break now. We'll come back in for the jam session. And before we go, just a reminder that you can get links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes. Just scroll up on your mobile device and you'll see stuff to click through, including um, a link to the blog post itself. Um, or if you're on the website, rsrockstars.com, and just look for Steve Shady. That's the blog post. But I've got a, a YouTube playlist there so you can listen to this and see uh, or listen to all the songs that Steve's done and, and hear the stuff we're talking about. Also, if you're watching this or listening to this on YouTube now, feel free to drop a comment in to the uh, the comments below. Let us know what you think. And um, if you hear stuff that really is cool to you during the episode, um, feel free to just look at the number. You can pause the, the YouTube video, look at the number, type that in, say what it was, drop that in the comments, and that helps us start to gather uh, cool timestamps for stuff that happens in the show. So we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave Pinsley and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Whisperoom ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisperoom has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more or at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Steve Shady joining us from Denton, Texas, talking about recording with Willie, Nelson, lots of other greats. Um, and so we're going to dig in some more questions about that. You ready to jam, dude? Absolutely. Always. All right. Cool, man. So um, again, uh, one of the Willie videos that we included in the playlist is Last Man Standing, and it looks like an incredible live session video. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that, um, maybe how you 
set up the band, but particularly how did you get Willie's guitar sound and vocal sound on that? Well, oh, that's always been the same. He has a corner in the studio he's been using since way before I got there. And I put a, well, I used to put a 47 on him and his amp is behind the curtain. The video you're talking about might have a wooden fence prop behind it, but um, <clears throat> behind there is a booth and, and it's his Baldwin stereo amp. It's got a stereo pickup in the guitar and it's a 57 on it. And the combination between the 57 and then what's bleeding into his mic and the room ambience is, is, is the sound on the guitar and the vocal is just that room. Sometimes when he leans into those mid range, you'll, you'll hear the room and <clears throat> yeah, you take one or the other away. Like if you take that vocal mic out when he's, when he's playing guitar, it's weird to the point where, Interesting. yeah. Oh yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm saying interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, I, so he's playing his acoustic, although I I don't remember seeing the hole in the acoustic. Was that like an older one and this is the newer one, or is that the same guitar and I just didn't notice the hole in the acoustic? Uh, uh, you must not have noticed because uh, he's, that's what he plays always. It's the that, same guitar forever, right? Yeah. Yep. There's a big old hole in it. Looks like it's going to fall apart, but it's shellacked all together. It's really tight and it's a really amazing guitar man it just stays in tune once it gets acclimated what is it man that's a good question i should know that's some kind of martin some old <laughs> some old ass martin <laughs> old ass martin so and it's um it's got steel strings on it or nylon strings no it's a, it's a cat gut it's, it's a cat, classical. cat gut. okay classical yeah. and then he's so it's the pickup in the guitar that goes to the amp that gets the 57 and then the mic that's there for the vocal picks up the front of the guitar and it's that mix of all that that gets the sound we're so familiar with that's right here i got the it's a it's a 19 well it doesn't say the date it's a martin n20 nylon string wait you got it right there next to you no i just google it okay right (laughs) (laughs) now that doesn't come with me although i've had to tote it around and it's it's those times where you're going wow someone's going to sideswipe me or something's going to happen. I'm going to be forever. The guy that broke trigger. Oh, <laughs> or God. Even you're, like, his- you're like, I really, I've been in this car for uh, 24 hours and I really need to go to the bathroom, but I can't leave this in the car. <laughs> oh man. It's I've, I've driven around with this amp in the back from the ranch over to the studio. It says Willie Nelson and family. I'm like, man, this is just a magnet for people to follow you around. Right. For sure. Uh, man. <clears throat> or even tuning it. If it makes a creak or a crack when, when I'm tuning it, sometimes Tom Hawkins, his guitar tech can't, can't be there. Cause Willie will just say, I want to come in on a whim and man, it, every creak you're thinking, dude, I'm going to be the guy who broke trigger forever. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but, yeah. It's, um, it's always the guitar he comes in with. It's it's the same one. Um, what about electric guitars? What do you like to do uh, for other guitar players for recording their electrics? Uh, I always like to have two bikes. I like to treat them like most of the time to my ears alone. Each mic will not sound that great, but uh, when I put them together, I like I like to focus on a two mic sound and then make it one. And back in the day, I used to have the balls to sub them together and (laughs) put them to a track, but now you don't have to. So I've kind of lost that. I don't know what you call it. It's not that I'm afraid to, it's just, I just don't, you know, when you have 99 tracks, you don't need to. Right. So you might have more than one mic on the guitar and you just put them on individual tracks and pro tools. You're saying. Yeah. I I, I always use two mics at least on a, on an electric guitar. amp. So what would those, what would those be? Uh, 57 or, and a 421 or a 57 and a Royer, uh, sometimes an SM7 and a 57, but that's too much seven. So I don't usually do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So what, how would you describe what you think the difference is between like the, um, 57 and what was the other one? The tube? Uh, it's a 421. It's a, uh, Sennheiser 421. Usually see them on Toms. The dynamic. Yeah. That's two yeah. dynamics. Right. But do you do a, you said sometimes you use a tube mic on the, on the amp as well? Uh, no, sometimes I use a Royer ribbon mic 121. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the 57 is brighter and, and more toothy, you know, kind of edgy and the 421, not so much. And I'll put the 57 
somewhere in between the cone and the edge, the center cone and the edge, and I'll put the 421 usually closer to the center. So it's kind of just moving them around and EQing it that way. And then you put them together and it just makes one sound for me. I, I rarely, yeah, you know, in a pinch, if I'll just use a 57, but you know, no glamorous stories with me, man. I just go with what's worked for 24 years. <laughs> no, that's great. That's what we like to hear. We, we definitely want to know about the stuff that works. So um, is it an issue to you that the 57 and the 421 are about the same distance from the cone and the amp? Or is that really not a big deal? No, that's that's an issue for me, unless they're 180 out. You know, I don't like phasiness. And I mean, the world is out of phase, so I'm not measuring my overheads with a you know, tape measure like I've seen some people do. But right. yeah, I like the capsules to line up. And uh, again, I hate to say it, it's not glamorous, but I'll just look on the screen or I'll pan them or, you know, just make sure we're not getting weird. Uh, and then I'll go move it forward or backwards. Okay, dig it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they, they should be the capsules. You know, my, my gut is like, Lidge, you should line up these capsules on these mics. But then sometimes you go listen and one mic seems to sound pretty good close and the other mic seems like, oh, this mic needs to, wants to back off. Right. And I, then I'm conflicted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes on overdubs, I, you know, Andy, Andy Johns, I'll go back to, he used to slam that thing up against the screen. Uh, he'd use a 414 and a 57. And I would close my, I, I closed mic stuff forever, but now I, I don't mind having a foot away, even a dynamic mic and crank it up. All that, Lonely Boys, all that solo stuff, the mics were foot away from it. Oh, that's great, because that's what I wanted to ask you about. Um, one of the things I noticed listening to um, the Heaven official video that's that's in the, the playlist as well is, um, you know, you've got this a rhythm guitar. First of all, it's great groove and pocket with those guys. But you've got a rhythm electric guitar, but then you've also got a solo electric guitar. And I wondered if you approached the way that you thought about those two guitar tones differently yeah i mean i, I like a, a a nice tight rhythm and i don't mind a little airiness i mean how much air is getting between 12 inches of a hundred and plus db you know who knows but i just notice uh it just gives us some some space some room not without actually hearing room you know what i mean not not room sound just it's just not in your face you don't listen to the amp with your ear up to the speaker so right and then I'll put I'll put room mics up. Sometimes those are great, man. You know, sometimes they're terrible. Yeah, like you just never know until you just try it. Yeah, a lot of times I'll just keep the overheads or the drum room mics on while he's. I mean, he's so loud. It's just you're going to get a, a, a sound no matter where those room mics are in the room. Damn. So, yeah, sometimes I'll do something three or four feet away but there's always a 57 on there and usually a 421 close mic but not touching the damn screen the, you know not touching the grill cloth but you know and the, yeah i mean i remember uh you know feeling like there is a sound you get from a 57 when it gets really close to an amp because it's you kind of want that almost like pillow low end that the proximity effect that kind of wraps itself around the guitar sound and with some sounds and then other times it just sounds muddy to me and I want to back things off. But, you know, I, I feel like 57s are, you know, t have, tend to be kind of happy if they get close to an amp. But like if I've got a ribbon mic, for example, um, it doesn't want to be that close. It gets too mushy if I get yeah. super close. Right. Right. Yeah. Another mic I use a lot is, is, uh, 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 six, uh, four, uh, Sennheiser 409, which not the 609, but the 409 with the gold grill. Uh, Sennheiser, yeah. they stopped making them in the they're like side address, right? No, nah, well, yeah, it's a, it looks like a, a square wafer, it's black on the back, yeah, gold on the front, and they quit making them because I don't know, they seem to quit making all kinds of all the stuff I like. So, <laughs> I got five of those from Queensryche's drummer, which is really an interesting story. They he used them on promised land record threw him in his closet i saw him on ebay one day and they were like just almost next to nothing and they had hardly been used and i just snatched all five of them and it's a very compressed sound to me and i'll mm -hmm. use them on toms i'll use them on guitar cabinets uh but yeah it's like a compressed 
I don't know how to explain it, but it's it's not toothy at all. But I, I dig it, man, for like some '90s metal or some rock. You know, it's just, it, just, it does the trick. I, yeah, I need to indeed. pull those back out. Go ahead. No, that's great. I, I like those mics. Um, we used to use. Um, I feel like there was a six oh nine. Was there an EV egg shaped six oh nine? We used as um, I could be misremembering that model number for Tom Mike's dynamic. Uh, I well. know that Sennheiser reissued the, the 409 as a 609. It was black and silver, but it doesn't sound anything to, to like it. So uh, I didn't dig yeah. it. Um, yeah, I don't know the egg shape, the egg shape like. Uh, but those, I like those side address dynamics. They're cool for like getting in front of guitar amps easily or getting over toms. Mm-hmm. In between the cymbals, like for short, stubby arm drummers that have everything too close for you. There you go. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I set up a drum kit, I put everything way too close. It's because I'm not good enough to reach for the thing that I want to hit next. <laughs> well, that's it. People are always asking me, you know, I might hit that. I might hit that. I'm like, I don't care. It's a $600 mic and I want to get your Tom sound. I'm not worried about it. It's what the grill is for. Hit away. I've never seen a, Decent 421 that doesn't have a divot in it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I got a dent in my grill. It's one of my uh, one of my Roswell mics here. Sadly, got knocked over. Um, and this time, it wasn't Mystery Lidge that knocked over. I think it was actually somebody else. Um, and so I was like, I you know, I emailed Matt McGlynn, who makes the mic about. It, and I was like, dude, I'm I'm bummed. Like it got knocked over and the grill's dented, and you know, I might need to get it looked at or something. He's like. He's like, those grills, you know, they're just, they're just wire meshes. It's like, if you, um, you know, if they sound, if the mic sounds fine to you, don't sweat it so much. Um, you can take the grill off and reach inside and push the metal back out. And I was like, oh, I never, I didn't even know that. It's such a simple solution. You could just kind of push it back out again. Get ready for the next hit. Exactly. Cool, man. Well, so another record that you did that we've got in the, uh, the video of is um, Smog, Bill Con Callahan. Uh, rock bottom riser session. And I uh, wondered if you wanted to talk about that. It just has a really like, it's sort of a very, it's like a loud, quiet kind of record. And you've got this big guitar wrapping itself around you and vocals. Uh, was that something that's, that was recorded to analog tape? Do you want to talk any about re recording really loud, quiet stuff like that? Yeah, sure. There, he was. He didn't even want a computer on in the building when we did that record. So it was done to you know on the on the Studio Eight Hundred two inch, uh, twenty four track. Uh, had the echo chambers going. Uh, had the two plates going. I had after hours. I had the women's bathroom at the golf shop next door going. <laughs> I didn't want to, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is is a great. You know, uh, uh, the lobby, anything that I could get any kind of different ambience out of. And, you know, it's made any room that I could into, you know, two, the, we had two Ampex 102s at the time. I had those going for delay. And, uh, man, that was a dark session. Like, not bad. It was just like literally he'd come in, turn the lights down. And I have a policy where I don't let the band out dark me because then they can see you and you can't see them. I don't right, like that right. at all. <laughs> so I worked, it, it, it was midnight all the time on this session. And a um, very introverted dude, really good musician. Uh, it was it was like sensory deprivation though. I'd, I'd show up at noon and we'd dark everything out and we'd stay there 12 hours and not leave. Wow. Yeah. You know, I've done dark sessions and I've dropped the lights on everything to get the right mellow vibe on stuff. Um, and it's definitely effective, but it's can, it's can be tough, man, to be in the studio. Uh, in that darkness all day. Yeah. And, uh, for a while when I was, for, when I was still assisting Larry, we'd do these rap sessions and before pro tools that, you know, that'll teach you how to punch man, for sure. And, uh, you know, he would do the noon to midnight and I would do the midnight to noon. And that just, I, I, I'm a guy who goes to bed between four and six every morning, gets up when my eyes open, but that does something to you when you're in the studio, you're not seeing people. It's just weird, man. Yeah, it is weird. I, I call them the vampire sessions. And I, it was a record we were doing where we started out with daytime hours and then it just kept moving forward later and later until it was like every day was going at, you know, at, at dinner time 
and don't come out till late in the morning. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting and it's intriguing for the adventure of it for a bit, but it does get really bizarre and weird. And it was like right through the summer. So it was like, I was missing all this beautiful weather. We had a pool at the house we were staying at now. I just, I don't think I ever went to it. Oh yeah. I don't care about amenities cause I don't get to use them. I just, yeah. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah man. It's, I, that's even in my fifties, I'm still doing, those are the hours I prefer, but it does change you. And then I come up here to Dallas and Denton and I have to flip it all around for my girlfriend and my, my mom and do stuff around the, her house. And just like, man, you're always moving and you're always flipping your schedule 180 degrees. So I'm pretty wacko just from that. Nice, man. Um, there was another record you did, The Super Suckers, Pushing Through. Um, <laughs> so rock and live band in the studio. And I wondered what you learned about doing that well. Um, and what sort of vocal setup you find works for something like that. It looked like maybe you were using an SM7 on that. Yeah, those guys are great. I, I worked with Eddie Spaghetti in 1990, 1998. And then about 10 years later, we ran into each other. I've done probably five records with them now. Um, they like they like things loud and they like to be in the room with each other. They're down to a three-piece now since that video. Uh, I just did... I did a hundred hours in one week with them out there for analysis last June, but you know, they're great guys and, and I love it. They're just there. They, they're, they're just seasoned. They don't mess up, you know, how to rock, but I'll tell you what I learned on that one. You know, you got to, that I had to be the burger King of recording. All, 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 I do <laughs> on their session. You have it your way, you know, it's because Eddie knows what he wants and, I've never been one to like really push my agenda on any band. I'm I'm there to facilitate what they want. Mm -hmm. He is so specific that the rough mixes are pretty much almost mixes. So, it's yes. a trend. yeah. So so what are some things that you feel um, about you allow you to have had a career like you've had and work with such a great variety of of talented bands and and uh, so many records and stuff like that. Is it that, that Burger King mentality? Yeah. I mean, when it's appropriate, it's not, it's not that I don't care. I've been accused by, uh, you know, jokingly by my, some of my peers that, you know, I don't give a shit. I just want to get paid, but it's not true. What I care about is getting, I believe you're there to facilitate the artist getting what they want. I don't, I don't have a, uh, what do you call it? A dog in the race. I don't, I don't need to be a producer. I don't need to be this. I don't need to be that. I just, I just want to go in and enjoy getting sounds and helping guys get what they want. And I'll, I'll go to great extremes and personal sacrifice to do that. If I like the people, if I don't, then I just get lost in the sounds and, and uh, you still get 110%. I just don't focus on the process and and being part of the outcome other than I'm here to get the best sounds I can and just lose yourself in the work, you know. But Burger King, I mean, that's a joke. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I always care, but you got to know when to detach. Or well, have, least, it, have it your way, right? That's the, right. Whole, that's the whole idea. I mean, I'll let you know. I'll go, man, I, I just really don't agree with that, but. At the end of the day, and I always usually put little, some little smart ass shit on there, like I don't, yeah, I'll have it your way. I'm never going to listen to this once we leave here anyway. <laughs> you know, that's just me <laughs> joking around. But, um, yeah, I don't want to name any names, but I got a lot of friends that really have gotten into arguments and, and get pissed off if they don't get their way. You know, just like you're here to make the dude comfortable and get the best sound and, and best performance you can. That it's not the me show. I never thought it was the me show, right? I think that's coming up in a, in a, like, like we touched on a commercially run facility where most stuff comes through. A lot of people just come through cause it's Willie's place and then they go off somewhere else and mix it. Mm -hmm. So, and then there, there are friends or bands that I work with that I really, you know, I really care. And then I try to like Lucas, they know what they want. So I try to get on board with that. Even if I don't agree. And a lot of times you end up going, wow, you were wrong, dude. That works. That's to yeah. me the beauty of this. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, well. So I mean, it's like this the me show idea, and um, I really don't agree with what you're doing, or you know, if you know the the idea, like, hey, if you guys want to make it sound like shit, what what that does though is uh, that presumes that the artist or the producer 
doesn't really have a vision for what they're doing, you know? And right. like it's it's missing the point that they might be hearing something a certain way and to them this is the right artistic statement. This is like the right way to get what they're trying to get. And and if you just as the engineer, as the producer, if you just step back and just let them guide it towards where they want to go, they might miss their mic or miss their mark, excuse me, just like, you know, we might try and write a song and it turns out to be not such a great song on the on the quest to write a great song. But um but they may also have they may also be headed somewhere that's like they they really do have the right answer for what they're trying to do musically. Yeah, man, it's very important to me to realize that I'm not always right. And what I do is I don't want to say it's secondary, but it's not the focal point. But it's it's getting a performance across. If I sit there and needle fuck a guitar sound for two hours and they lose the damn take over it that's not cool man you know yeah yeah so. needle fuck a good yeah, right. <laughs> all right so um another maybe a good example of uh having a vision for something super suckers get the hell um has a killer flange drum solo in it i wonder <laughs> yeah. if you want to talk about that yeah eddie eddie was said i want this to do and he waved his arms and went whoosh whoosh you know on the drums i was like that sounds like a flanger he said like zeppelin but on steroids you know i was like okay so i put a plug in over the bus and at that point turned it on which is another great thing about pro tools you just you can do all this stuff in about five minutes and automate it and if it doesn't work take it off so they liked it so much they were worried that the mixer guy wasn't going to be able to do it so i just printed it that's another thing i don't i don't really like giving my stuff away to the wrong people people mm -hmm. that take credit for your work but i don't i don't have a problem like doing something like that you know mm -hmm. i'm not gonna give my i've had very high profile producers and engineers on the other end ask for my automation and plugins and all that i'm thinking well that's what you're getting 10 grand a song to do why don't you do that you know that's one thing but if my buddy Eddie wants to take a little breakdown that's flanged out and make sure it's the same. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, that's cool. Maybe you just need a package. Uh, maybe the, the, the high end mixer is welcome to the plugins and the settings. Um, mm -hmm. and you just, here's the buy now button. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, I struggle with that cause um, I like to teach. I like to show people what I'm doing. I don't think it's a big secret. If you give the same guitar and amp to three dudes, you're going to get three different or, or three ladies, whatever you're going to get three different performances. So I struggle with intellectual property versus, you know, you're being a dick. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Well, I think it's just that also, it's also kind of having a sense because I've certainly worked on projects where, you know, I, I put in the lion's share of some work on something for the super budget rate because I, I wanted to, or because I believed in it. And then maybe that project goes and and picks a, a a big name mixer or mastering engineer who got three times what I got for you know a single <laughs> day's work, right? And I'll be like, and and maybe it didn't even come back all that good, and I was be like, eh, well, you know, what are you gonna do? But I guess that's just you know that's the way the stuff goes. I think so. And at, at the end of the day, I I do this for myself. I'm fortunate enough to have. It, uh, how do I put it? Uh, I, I'm able to do this for myself. I don't have to be f fighting about, well, you got this off my work. You know, it's, and, and these days I pretty much do work with friends and people I like. I'm not a, a, a burnout dude in a commercial facility anymore. Right. You know, so I care more, but yeah, there, you have those times back 10, 10, 15 years ago where I'm like, what the hell? I just got screwed. But you want to focus on that? Or you want to focus on moving on? Get yeah, right. Some jams done. <laughs> got, some, got some nice records to be working on now instead. <laughs> or you could stay up all all day long with the uh, with the lights turned off. Hey, man, you know that's <laughs> that's that's on many levels. The lights have been turned off for a while. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. Well, so uh, now another mellow session you did was um, Willie Nelson. Something you get through. Um, yeah, it's got a real mellow sound, and I wondered if you—I don't—I don't think the lights were turned all the way off, but uh, I wondered if you wanted to just talk a little bit more about, like, you know, anything you remember from that session and getting that sound. Well, he made me cry with that song, <laughs> which is pretty awesome because, I mean, music—if music evokes that much emotion, then it's you're you're doing something really cool. Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, those a lot of the tracks now over the last five or six years have come. They're cut in Nashville with Buddy Cannon, and then they come to Perd and Alice, and I do the the vocals, guitar, probably usually Mickey. Uh, sometimes Willie comes in with his band, and we do. That's what I'm working on up here now. He comes in with his his band, came in with his band, did a bunch of gospel tunes, but that. Man, he just nailed it, dude. We did like two, maybe three takes, but he had it on the first one. That's he, great. He was feeling that song, man. But it's always, it's always the same spot. He's very comfortable. He comes in. Uh, you know, you're ready. You better be ready when he comes in. Not like he's going to be upset or anything. It's just I'm there to be able to hit record when he's ready. Sometimes he doesn't even walk in the control room. He'll just come in and sit down. And I hit F12 and watch it go salmon pink across the screen, and and he does it. That's funny. I don't think I use F12. I use uh, number pad three. There's that, and then the space bar, Apple thing. Well, it yeah. used to have an Apple. I always go, oh, Apple Z. And I Apple. know, I do, too. People like, hey, what Apple? What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know why Apple got rid of the Apple. I know. It was the greatest thing. The Apple key was the best. Well, if you make five million keys without it, you probably save <laughs> Uber amounts of dollars. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. So um, yeah, he just came in and sang the shit out of that man. I, I was in tears on playback. I was like, "Damn, that's a good feeling, man." I've I've gotten emotional in sessions, and it's so much fun to do. I don't always feel emotional about what was moving me at the time later when I listen back, but I don't really care. Yeah, you know, it's that it's that feeling when it happens that that counts to me. Yeah, man, just, you know, that's, that's why I do this. That's why I played music. And then I got in this accidentally, like we spoke about. And then I got extremely unfocused on what was important, which is the music. And I'll tell you this, my daughter summed it up. She's 19 now, but she was about eight. She comes toddling through the room with her friend and the friend's looking at this, the Lonely Boys platinum record on the wall. And she goes, yeah, that's my dad's big CD. And they just went skipping off down the hall. I was just like <laughs> sledgehammer to like, wow. Yeah, that doesn't mean shit to her. And it really, you know, it's great. It's a nice accolade, shiny metal thing on your wall. And but whether I had that or not, it was still cool, you know? Yeah, totally, man. Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's, uh, I always say my daughter's the best record I ever made. So there you go. Well, as long as I get that one right, I'm doing all right. Oh, they'll help humble you because she doesn't know any different. You know, it's just like we were out, out front at a show one time. She's like, "Are we gonna go back there?" This is all when she was little. She, I was like, "No, I'm, I don't know this band. We're just here to jam out." She goes, "Well, I want to be in the back." I'm like, "You know, sometimes the front's as good as the back." You know. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, backstage can be boring. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, speakers aren't pointed that direction. The sound no. isn't supposed to sound good back there. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a, I don't know how I got off on that, but that's, that's a humbling moment. Daddy's big CD. I was like, oh, yeah, check. You're not that's all that. Funny. <laughs> that's funny, man. Um, well, it's good for us to be humbled and, and keep, keep, you know, bringing forward our beginner's mind and, and learning as we go. Yeah, man. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, so an another thing that I wrote down uh, um, when you guys did the uh the the Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard stuff um it's all going to pot 
I noticed there were some great horn parts on there, and I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you like to record horns in the studio. Yeah, I mean, I didn't record those horns, but I like to put them up as a group. Uh, I don't need a mic for each horn. I mean, I went through that phase and all that, but I just kind of listen to the section and spot mic and, and, and try to make it. I mean, I don't need it. If the horn section is good enough, I don't need to manipulate a horn section. They're doing it already. It's like a, a, a group vocal or something, you mm-hmm. know, just mm-hmm. move dudes around like they used to. I'm big on that instead of grabbing each. Just get your ass out of the chair, go out there, move some things around, move, tell a guy to move back or forward, move the mic to the center of the speaker instead of hit grabbing the EQ button. It's just, that's just fun. Is that fun? I think it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but so, so can you uh, give us some more details? So, like, an, uh, um, a group of horns means how many horns? What would be what would be in that group possibly on a on you know everyday session or something? And how many mics might you be thinking about like actually putting up in order to, you know, not not individually mic them, but spot mic them or or capture them as a group? Yeah, or, around my parts, it's usually three or four. It's just. Uh, tenor and a sax, a trumpet, trombone, and then maybe an alto sax. It's usually three in general, but, and, uh, you can, I usually put up a stereo pair and then I'll stick one in the middle up high, just kind of get a, and I'll, I'll set a pair far back to 87s. Again, not glamorous, you know, or you know, if I want to close my come, I'll use a uh, D12 on a horn or something that's, not too bright and i'm not it's just utilitary mic it you know just 87s or 414s 421 this on the side of the sax and the uh, 414 on the front or just whatever's not used up already but just grab grab something and use it yeah so it's less about like you know trying to worrying about choosing the perfect mic for it it's more about like not fucking up the sound of these three people playing together yeah, listen. Uh, I'll try and listen in the room and and just man, I got over gear snobbery a long time ago, man. You know, it's just just because you have three thousand dollars worth of mic or five thousand dollars worth of mic or ten thousand dollars worth of mic on something doesn't mean it's going to sound that way. You know, it's just if something doesn't if something doesn't sound right, I was like, all right, what's wrong with it? Oh, it's too bright. Get a less bright, bright mic. But on, I don't do too much horn stuff. But when I do, I just throw up. I start with 87s uh, if it's this room, room, th- you know, group thing we're talking about and go from there. Although I've gotten away from 87s lately then, but, you know, just what does it sound like in the room? Let's make it sound like that. Nice, man. I like that. It's a good tip. Um, I noticed in some of the videos, too, it looks like there's um, maybe it was the Nashville sessions. And I don't know whether the, these were the specific ones you did or not. Um, but the, uh, I, I spotted Fred Elkringham playing drums on a lot of that stuff. Is he one of the guys you're working with on, on drums on these sessions now? No, that's, that's Buddy's crew there, man. If I'm working, okay, all right. the, uh, Heroes, they came in on Heroes and the Merle stuff. And that was, a, that was the last of the whole band coming in. Just, it's, I don't know. I think it's just Willie's always moving. So mm-hmm. it's easier to get the tracks. And then follow him with the hard drive. Right, totally. All right, cool. And he cool. and uh, he doesn't want to really. He likes his place. He he comes to where he comes home and works on stuff. Yeah, totally. But so yeah, was, oh, go ahead. Well, so they might track it here, but then he's he's like, yeah, let's get this back to my studio so I can finish it out. Yes, yes, because he's very comfortable here, and he's just he's I I, I know that. At 86, I'm not going to want to be farting around in the studio. You know, he comes in because he loves the music. It's not a whole deal. It's not a. If he comes in to, to mess around in the studio, it's with his own band. Yeah, totally. He'll sing a record in a day, man. Wow. Yeah. He just wants to get the new music and the songs out. Yeah, and, and he enjoys it. I don't want to downplay. It's not like it's not like that. It's coming out wrong. It's just he gets it done, man. Yeah. And, and then if it needs redoing, he's totally cool with coming back and doing it. That's yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. It's the way I like to work if I can. I, I prefer to be creating more stuff uh, because that's the part of the process I love the most than tweaking it in post production. You know. Yeah, that goes back to that. Like, go out there and move it around, man. You know, it's move the mic around. Just go listen. So many 
and myself included, I got into this thing, God, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where I just wasn't, it, I was on autopilot. I wasn't listening. Here's what you're supposed to use. So I'm going to use this and I'm going to go with it and, and turn some knobs till I like it. Whereas now I'm just like, let's go, let's underthink it. Let's go out there, see what it sounds like, see if these mics work. Those mics don't work. Let's try these mics, you know. I like that. Let's underthink it. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's funny. I can't remember who it was, but this guy was playing. The producer was in the room with me, and the guy was playing too much. He just gets on the talk back. He's just, dumb it up, son. <laughs> nice. <laughs> he told the dude to dumb it up. I was like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a good tip. I mean, I need to tell myself that all the time. Yeah. I try not um, to think that much. <laughs> well, so let's talk about, uh, you know, mixing and how this applies to mixing. Okay. What, what happens in mixing? Are you involved in the mixing on this stuff? Uh, how do you like to do it? On the Willie stuff? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, I'm not involved. They mixed that out in, back in Nashville. But I mixed a couple of things uh, in the last, since Buddy Can has been producing uh, I just approach it. It just depends on the material. Like this gospel thing I'm fixing to do, I'm going to try and keep it like, as, as, as Willie said, you know, that's how it happened. You know, I'm not going to try and bikini wax it. Nice. Yeah. The stuff that I'm here at Tony Castle's great engineer, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff that comes to me, it's, it, it'll come two or three times and it looks like they're mixing. I shouldn't speak for them, but it appears to be they're mixing as they go. That makes sense because it's, yeah. it's more refined each time. So I don't yeah. know what their process is. I like to sit down and get about 80% on a song and then start another mix and revisit it later. I don't, I don't yeah. to finish it on the day I start it. Um, and do you mix sort of all in the box now with, with within Pro Tools or do you, I mean, I've seen, I, I mean, I think I've seen in some of the videos, although that may have been over here in Nashville, um, a big old Neve console. That's a, there's a Neve. There was a Neve console. Well, there's still a Neve out there. We had an 8024 out there and an SSL. And now, now we have a 5088. I mix in the box with hardware, hardware uh, inserts. Okay. All right. Dig it. Yeah. Um, any tips you want to share about things that you really enjoy with mixing? You know, is there something you like to do on the master bus that really gets you to where you feel good about mixing in the box? Oh yeah, man. I like I like the Allen Smart C2. It depends if I want something glossy and popping. If I want something smooth, I'll use uh, compression. You know, we've got a bunch of different kinds. Thirty three six oh nine. I have a vac rack. Uh, if I want something super tuby, I got uh, I've got a Manly. And these are all uh, outboard that you'll just insert on the mix bus itself. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, um, any other plugins that you've that are sort of uh, favorites of yours now? Uh, I mean, I really like the exponential audio reverbs, uh, empty room system makes really good reverb. Um, let's see, uh, uh if it's something I need a vocal, if it's something I need in your face in general, but particularly vocals, I use the R Vox, uh, what else, man? Filter bank EQs, stuff like that. I don't, I don't really do a whole lot to stuff, but I try to get it. I mean, there's always, I'm always shelving out low end. I like subtractive EQ better than a- a- additive. Um, you start taking mud away and things get brighter, you know, it's, you mm-hmm. don't have to, um, what, what are you asking? Plugins, you know, uh, those reverbs, uh, I don't use real, IK multimedia. I use some wave stuff. So I use IK multimedia, just weird stuff that like when I didn't have a lot of money, I would buy and I got used to it. Yeah, and, interesting. I've got all the wave stuff. I've got a, you know, I'm about to go into the UAD stuff because everybody raves about it. But I just don't, I'll just throw anything on there that I need, really. But those, yeah. the reverbs are important to me. And, and I'll use that chamber out there too. I'll print that. You know, that's, that's kind of a nice glue. And then to go into the Ampex 102, I like doing that, the half inch machine. Mm hmm. So plug-in wise, yeah, those those reverbs. I mean, the, it's really weird because people get my stuff. They're like, none of your plugins opened up. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess. I mean, IK Multimedia is really like a huge. Not, I don't think you know. It's not like Waves. Everybody's got Waves, right? Indeed. But he's got UAD. You know. <laughs> so, yeah, I just, IK makes some really cool stuff. I mean, they made like the um, T Rex 
mm-hmm. um, pl- plugins, which which have always been very cool. Um, and then uh, Exponential Audio is uh, super cool, and I have the Nimbus and the R4. Yes, um, and those both sound great, and it, it just seems like they're big natural. You can really get a realistic sound with those reverbs, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I'm still on R2. I'm two behind you. <laughs> but I've got also the Phoenix Verb. And, and man, when I, st- when I heard that, I was working with Christopher Cross, and he had a template. I was working in his house uh, in Austin, and I just pulled up this Verb. I was like, what the hell is that, dude? That's great. He said, it's, it's uh, you know, it, exponential audio. So I bought all the stuff. And um, the guy I think used to work for Lexicon. I was a big fan of the 480. I am a big fan of the 480. Not I was, but and he wrote a lot of the algorithms. Is what I was reading. I don't know, man. I don't dig in too much. I like the fact that I can pull it up and not have to tweak too many knobs. I don't want to mix the reverb. I want to just put it on there and sound good. Yeah, that's Michael Carnes. I've actually done a video with him and, and met him a couple of times. Um, and he's he's a really interesting cat, and he he's been making reverbs for a long time, so he really knows what what they're made of, you know? Yeah. I like the, the end of it to put it rudimentary. Like it's just, it doesn't get squirrely. That's what I notice on, on not good reverbs. They can sound good at the beginning. And then at the end it tapers off and it's weird. Yep. So yeah. Like, very cool. Yeah. it's well, about I it. Dig it. Well, we're sort of getting near in the end here. Let me jump into the, the, the final questions and we'll kind of uh, blaze through these. Um, we can do, we can go for kind of quick answers on them too, but okay. when you, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? Uh, myself, man, you know, you, you gotta have confidence, but you can't be cocky. You can't be a, a dickhead about things, you know? So there's just, I never, I never planned on doing this. I never studied anything. I, I was taught eight years by one guy and then I just kind of went out on my own. So I was always questioning myself, you know, now, I still question myself, but in a, in a positive, healthy way, like, Oh, maybe you should ask this kid that just came in the studio, what people are using, or, you know, I'm always open to suggestions, but I always just didn't think I didn't give myself enough credit where credit was due, I guess. Right. I, right. <laughs> um, now how about some of the best advice you remember receiving along the way? Oh man, let me think about that. Uh, I guess that the artist's comfort, I think we touched on this earlier, com- you, yeah. you're, you're not the number one thing in the room, man. You're expendable, but that's kind of harsh. But, you know, it's just you, you're you you're there to facilitate the artist, or at least that's my philosophy, not, not put your stamp on it, but just help them get their stamp out there. Keep things. Um, so so a, qu- a question related to that, when you when you feel like you've done a really great job of accommodating the artist do you see something that comes do you do you get feedback that comes back to you like they you know you see them visibly and sonically light up with what they're doing um any thoughts about that i think the feedback i guess a lot of a lot of people are very comfortable with me because i treat people like people you know i don't fan out i don't treat people with preferential treatment uh i just Man, an artist is really vulnerable in the studio. If you think about it, this is their, you're hearing their work that, you know, they're not sure, maybe not sure about. I just, I don't know how to put it, Liz. It's just, I just treat you like you're the, you're a regular dude. And that has worked for me, you know? Yeah. I think that's good advice. And I think it's great for you to remind everybody of just how vulnerable the artist is being in front of you in the studio. Yeah, man. Think about if you like every now and then I'll be asked to go sing something or play something and you get on the other side of that glass and all of a sudden you're in the fish tank, man. Yeah. yeah. They're looking at you and and that's how they feel. I I think, I mean, I don't have any, this is how I think my brain works. Well, this guy's or this artist is really putting it out there, you know, because this is where they have to do it to capture it, you know, (laughs) so that you're, you might be the first one hearing this. You know, in, in yeah. it's a very insecure feeling. If I can't even go out there without choking as many years as I've been on the other side of the glass, how do you think they feel, man? Unless you're someone like Willie or Merle, they just know they just know what's right, you know. But, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. So um, you've already shared a bunch of cool stuff talking about all these artists you work with, but um, have you got another like recording tip, hack, or secret sauce? Something you want to share with the rock stars that they could try out on their next record? 
Oh man, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> what's what's a cool trick you used recently? Where you're like, yeah, that was kind of fun to do. Man, I just you got me there. I mean, I like to use real stuff. I like to, I like using the chamber. I like I've already spoken about. It. I like to go out there and listen. I like to not rely on on it. the computers there if I need it, but I just like to try and get it as it as it sounds does that make sense i'm choking yeah. on this one <laughs> no, that's all right that's all right i mean you've already you've already shared a bunch of good stuff so um well let's let's get more specific on this channel but um do you have any like either favorite hardware stuff you like to have around sessions or or just anything that you're kind of excited about man i just i just i like tube tech compressors i like uh not really man i mean if I had to have one thing, I'd probably just get a Swiss Army knife, a, a piece of gear like the uh, distressor in a fifty-seven or something that works. You know, there's nothing nice. super, nothing super glamorous here, man. <laughs> yeah, but those are good, good tips and good choices. Yeah, I think I think people just like to hear. You know, they like to hear it come from you. Yeah, you know, that's cool. Uh, just. Um, Go ahead. Well, I was going to jump to software. Anything in the software world? I mean, you've already talked about some plugins. Um, Pro Tools. Any any other bits of software that you've enjoyed using? I like the Isotope stuff. When there's just you know the noise noise reduction stuff, I like mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing because I I got away from all that for a while and just dealt with noise. And sometimes there's a song that is just there's a noise in it that's just so distracting, and that stuff's pretty amazing. I don't know. Yeah, it does just, pure magic. Yeah. And without the artifacts, you know, it's like, wow, this is, this is good. So I really like that. I'm, I'm into that lately. So they just gave me a bunch of stuff. So I've been digging in deep on it. <laughs> yeah. RX seven is the one that I'm using. Although it may, is it up to RX? I think eight? that's, no, the, I think it's RX seven is the newest one. Yeah. yeah the ozone's up to eight. That's the mastering stuff. And yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to be digging into a lot of their stuff uh, shortly. And, and I find it just fascinating. Fascinating I'll you stuff. I'll tell you, uh, this uh, just, just dawned on me. Serato pitching time is really good for me because, you know, I'm, I'm always having to stretch, just stretch things a little bit to fill in the gap or whatever. And that's a pretty damn good program. I don't hear much artifacts if you don't ask it to do ridiculous stuff. Are you familiar with any of the pitching? Yeah, that's, that's kind of old school. I mean, that's been around for a minute, too. That was like the go-to if you needed to time stretch things. Yeah, and the, the same, I haven't had to change the, you know, I've gotten updates, but it works on all platforms. You know, it's just, that's been my experience. My original purchase still holds, still holds, you know. I don't have nice. To, yeah, that's, that's pretty good, but, you know, that's about um, it. All right. Any resources or, or tips for sort of just the business side of doing this stuff? You know, if people want to do, make records for more than just a hobby and they want to make a living out of it, what advice do you have for them? Man, when, it, when the going is good, sock it away. I don't think there's nowhere to go but down when you're up. You know what I mean? You the people I see people yeah. just blow through money, squirrel it away. And then when the times are hard, you're not suffering. Yeah, that's good advice. I, I like that and I've tried to live that way myself. Um yeah. sometimes it means you don't you know, even though you could afford to get the fancy thing, you just don't get the fancy thing right then. Yeah, my you know, my mom said something to me when I was a kid and I still remember she goes, If you got everything you wanted, nothing would be special. Well, so, that's true. It's good advice. I just kinda think about that. <laughs> um uh any tips or, or resources, something cool um as far as staying organized online, you know, that you just kinda keep your shit together with? Man, I, I like like I said before, I write a lot of stuff down and um, Genius Scan. I like that. That's a good little app because you can make PDFs right there and it likes to take pictures of stuff. But mm -hmm. no, man, I'm looking at that thing you sent me. What is it? Elephant? So there's that little picture of an elephant on it. I can't remember. It's oh, Evernote. 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 That's one. Yeah, <laughs> pretty cool. But uh, no, I'm 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 old school, dude. I write stuff down and now and Genius Scan is cool for just taking a quick picture. Then you don't have a bunch of, you know paper run or you know, rec even receipts you know if i go on a trip like if i had all the receipts from from my trip when i visited and saw you mm -hmm. that, that's like 30 crumpled up receipts in my bag you know so i would take a picture of them with genius scan makes a pdf boom done so it squirreled away in a folder for later at tax time if you need it yeah and i try to keep the yeah it's definitely get a good cpa too man i've got a guy that's killer because 
you know, he he'll give me advice like this sounds very boring, but he'll give me advice like, yeah, you're entitled to that uh, deduction, but I wouldn't take it because it's going to raise a red flag. Just little stuff like that, man. Yeah. You want the IRS, even if you're super up, up and up on the board, they can just stall you forever. Yeah, indeed. Well, you know, um, I, I, same thing with me. I've had the same CBA for, um, 25 years or something like that. And, um, I, I feel like there's more value in consistency than in trying to go with something that looks flashy and new and different, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I, I agree. I think, I feel like you're, if your tax returns are very consistent over your, your career that hopefully looks like a good sign you know, on the other yeah. end. And the if IRS. Yeah. And if you're playing ball by the rules, you don't have anything to worry about, but even so, they, it could, you can jam yourself up. Yeah. Well, the rules turn out to be a little bit difficult to understand. Turns out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's good to have somebody who can give you feedback. Right. <laughs> Watch your back. All right. So here's the last question. Um, this one is hypothetical. We're going to take the Wayback Studio machine. Okay. You, you get to go back and find young Steve Sh Shady, the real Steve Shady. Please right. stand up. And you're going to go say, yo, dude. Listen, I know you want to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Here's the single most important thing you need to know. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? You are not in the band. <laughs> you don't party with the band. Don't think you're ex you're not expendable. Just do your job to the best of your ability. Don't worry about being liked and all that stuff. Don't be, you know what I mean? Just be real. Treat people real. Yeah. That nice. makes sense. You know. I guess it took you a minute to learn that you weren't in the band because uh, the band kept leaving the station and somehow you were still at the station every time with those, with those dust balls. Right. At the truck stop, you're not on the bunk checklist, man. <laughs> there you go. Awesome, dude. Well, thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you. Um, let the Rockstars know how they can find you online. Where should they go check out you and your work? And uh, if they need to make their next big record, how do they reach out to you? Uh, steveshady.com and it's C-H-A-D-I-E looks like chatty and then if you want to laugh it's my dark humor you can go to steveshady50 on uh, Instagram I just keep it real nice man awesome <laughs> well I look forward to checking that out myself uh, dude thanks for being on the show with us it's been a pleasure hanging out with you and I look forward to seeing you in person again at whatever our next gathering is alright well make me look like a super genius because I'm sure there's, I bumbled my way through that man <laughs> Did you know we, we were both? It's 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 chill, man. It was great. You were you awesome. All right, I'm gonna look you up when I come back to Nashville. Groovy, dude. We'll talk soon, man. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music.